thrilled to have you all with us today. Uh, before we kick things off, I'll provide a bit of an overview of, of how today's call will go. Um, each of our experts is going to have a chance to introduce themselves and offer a few um, insights and analysis from their own individual areas of research expertise during the first half of the call before we move into reporter Q&A during the second half. Um, during that session, reporters who are joining us via webinar, you are welcome to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. All participants will for the duration of the call to streamline this process. So um, you are welcome to submit those questions anytime throughout the call, though, through the Q&A function. Um, or reporters who are joining us via phone, you are welcome to email me your questions. I think you've all got my email address by now. But for those who need a refresher, it is mckenzie underscore ab at keenan-blagler.unc.edu. Um, today is the sixth in the series of press briefings we've been offering on the business and economic impact of COVID-19. Today's conversation is going to cover uh, the impact that the virus has had and will continue to have on the future of higher education. So uh, to get things started, I'm very pleased to hand things over to uh, Mary Schuler. Mary is our North Carolina Area Health Education Center liaison um, and also a professor at the UNC School of Nursing. Um, Mary, thrilled to have you with us and um, happy to hand things over to you. Um, as you know, over the next few years, we're going to be having quite a nursing shortage. We're also going to be having a shortage of allied health experts. I have been in the business of higher education for 32 years. I really sort of hate to admit that. But um, I have seen the progression. One of the things that um, nursing and allied health uh, programs have tried to do over the last 20 to 30 years is find appropriate clinical sites. And um, all schools have been uh, working on that through the, throughout the country. One of the areas that they have most been interested in is the area of simulation. And I wanna bring up a study by the National League for Nursing, which was started in 2007. At that point, uh, they did a study across the United States to see how much simulation could uh, meet the needs of clinical education. And by the end of the study, which completed from 2007 until 2013, they found that if 50% of uh, education was through simulation, that program outcomes were as effective as being in the clinical area completely. So many, many schools throughout the uh, country, uh, medical schools, uh, nursing schools, respiratory care uh, schools, have really um, taken simulation to the next level. However, it really didn't become a total part of uh, education. I think what COVID-19 has done is made it really important to do it now. Um, so I see, I've talked to a number of schools throughout the country and I've seen what's been happening at UNC and um, they're really finishing up their senior students using simulation. Um, it should be interesting uh, to do some studies on this afterwards to see if they are as effective in the clinical settings as uh, you know, students who went through the traditional clinical, um, but it is, it is working. And I think that this particular COVID-19 uh, will not allow us to turn back. This is gonna be um, the wave of the future. Um, we're going as we go, we're building the plane as we go. But speaking of planes, that's where simulation really became uh, known because um, pilots use simulation all the time and that's where they get their safety record. So this is what we're hoping for uh, nursing and medicine. Um, I have included in my talking points some uh, various resources that are out there. And having talked to a number of schools and seeing what our school is doing, um, the 
there are two major resources that are available for nursing and allied health educators. And one of them is the AACN, the American Academy of Colleges of Nursing, American Association of Colleges of Nursing, who came out with a playbook to help um, uh, institutions be able to handle, you know, simulation and getting their students out into the workforce as quickly as possible, but also maintaining safety and public health, which is absolutely imperative. The other that has had a lot of simulation and is probably the leader in the country is the National League for Nursing. They have a coronavirus resource center for COVID-19 that will help educators. Um, actually, I, I decided to do some anecdotal research, and I have a niece-in-law who is in a second-degree program in Oregon, and I was asking her, what are they doing? And again, it's the simulation. It's the case studies. It's um, various programs that they're using. Um, the coronavirus is rapidly spreading across the world, as we know, and we need to have nurses and healthcare workers who can take over for our nurses and healthcare workers who are going to get tired. And one of the things that has come up is that we, uh, here at UNC, um, I run the uh, North Carolina AHEC. Um, RN Refresher Program. And the Friday Center, it's the UNC School of Nursing and the AHEC system that runs this. It is an amazingly large program. It is to get um, nurses back into the workforce as quickly as possible. I have included the article that um, the instructor and I wrote about why having experienced nurses go back into the workplace is so positive. Um, we are offering for one month free uh, this program. It's not gonna be for forever. Um, but as of that, we have increased the number of, of uh, RN who have experience, who will go into the workforce within the next three months to 150 nurses. If this, this is a very large, nursing class. So this is one way that definitely other schools, other institutions can get experienced nurses back into the workforce. Um, I think my time is up, uh, Mackenzie. And what I'd like to do is turn this over to Kelly for her thoughts and her uh, working towards education. So in my role, I'm both faculty and administration in the College of Arts and Sciences. So I have my own teaching experiences. I teach Bio 101 to 300 plus students, um, but I also have experiences on a team that supported all of our instructors in the transition and helping other administrators brainstorm support systems and policies throughout this whole transition. So let's talk first a little bit about the technical and operational issues involved in this current situation. If we go all the way back to March, I felt like we were preparing for a hurricane. And of course, in the South, we're used to that kind of preparation, but it was going to be something of unknown length and magnitude. And we had very little time to prepare, days, a week at most. And we were dealing with majority of faculty had zero online teaching experience. So we had to retool our entire operation in days. So it came down to some simple things at first. What papers and books did faculty and graduate student instructors need from their office? Um, could they grab cameras, labs equipment? Could they stay in their office and do simulations? Could they deliver equipment like sewing machines and VR headsets to their students at home? Could they even convert a lab or an arts experience and fulfill the same learning objectives online? So this led to a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and real distraction for our instructors. But keeping in mind, this was there for our students too. Nobody was in the state of mind they needed to really pull this off. Um, and of course, we knew there were inequities. Not everyone had the same access to internet, time, distraction-free environments. 
or even food and a safe environment to live in. So keeping that in mind, that on the faculty and the student side, nobody was quite in the state of mind to, to retool in a week, right? So let's talk a little bit about the tools, the support, and the policies that emerged at most institutions, keeping in mind that different institutions already had different levels of support that they had available to instructors and students. So I, I saw that the tools most faculty needed um, included three things. One was a learning management system, and that was something most faculty were familiar with. Um, it's basically a repository for um, PowerPoint slides, other information. It's a place where you can message students, have discussions, um, hold assessments, online quizzes, things like that. What most faculty didn't have experience with was transitioning their lecture or their live interactions to an online environment. And so faculty really needed to learn how to use a lecture capture tool. So something like Zoom can do that. You can put up a PowerPoint and hit record. Um, but most faculty didn't have experience with that. And then also face-to-face, -face, what if you wanted to have a discussion or hold the lecture in real time? You needed a platform like this, like Zoom, but there, of course, were many other platforms. So faculty needed the, the tools to do this. But it's not enough to just make those tools available. They need training and support. And generally, we see this as staff support. So institutions that have centers for teaching and learning that were robust, instructional designers stepped in, and they gave the basic trainings. This is how this technology works, press this button. Um, but they also had to train with pedagogy. Why would you use this tool? How would you use this tool to achieve the kinds of things you need to achieve in the learning that you're doing? They needed live help 24 seven, and they needed the faculty to faculty support that we know is really important in transitions and change within higher ed. So departmental chats, live, session, live sessions to commiserate with each other and so on. And then we also see policies emerging and they're still emerging in real time. So things like pass fail, what would the situation be for students? Different institutions implemented things like this differently. Could, they, could the students decide pass fail during the semester? Did they have to decide before the semester ended or did they have time afterwards to see how the semester shook out for them? What would faculty do about students who had gone missing or not fully participating? Were there proctoring tools available? How could you assess students without proctoring? Did we have a site license? Or were we discouraged to use tools like that because of the inequities that we saw emerging with students and availability and access to the internet? What about student evaluations of teaching? Would they be done? Would they be used in our evaluations for promotion and reappointment in the future? So lots of questions around policy. As we move forward, we need to learn from this semester. So we're gonna learn soon as student and faculty surveys are administered and we, we see the data from those. There's a lot of press right now that things are going horribly, but there's also a lot of press that things are, are going okay. So I don't want to discount that some of our students are having good experiences, that there are some amazing stories of faculty creativity, um, but for sure, some students have not had good experiences and that was to be expected. So we need to better understand that in addition to the inequities that were emerging and continue to emerge throughout the semester. And we need to keep saying as loudly as possible that what we just did was amazing under the circumstances, but it is not online education, it is triage. So even as we sustain this going into the summer, which we know we're doing, and potentially into the fall, we need to recognize this is not the equivalent of face-to-face -face teaching, and this is not even our best online teaching and learning. But we can do much better. It's different when you start the semester knowing that you're going to teach an online course. So you can make decisions that are different, such as giving multiple low stakes quizzes rather than two or three high stake exams, or balancing the amount of time you're online live with students versus asynchronous. Faculty certainly have new tools and they've made amazing shifts, some of which Mary talked about, and some of those things will be sustained. Um, but keeping in mind, many faculty are scheduled to teach different set of courses than they were teaching this spring. So there's still a lot of work to be redone and a lot of work that can't be reused. The inequities are still there for students and faculty and their emotions, which are still anxiety and uncertainty, have now also included sadness, withdrawal, and even anger and feelings of unfair unfairness. 
So in all of this, even if we can teach better online this summer and potentially into the fall, will the students come, right? We, we see what's happening with summer enrollments and at our university, they're okay. But we see that the fall projections are um, not looking good, that we'll likely see a fall drop if we continue online. Um, so how does this loss of revenue affect faculty and graduate student instructors? There's certainly new anxieties about this which include furloughs, layout, layoffs, teaching loads. And of course, I'm gonna pass this off to my colleagues who will certainly be touching more on um, financial issues related to what we can project into the future. So with that, thank you. I'd like to pass this off to Doug Shackelford, the Dean of UNC Keenan Flagler. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good morning. Uh, I've been asked to make a few comments about the broader financial and business challenges for universities. As the Dean of a Business School, I'm spending many of my waking hours thinking about this very topic. I'll split my comments into the immediate challenges and the ones that will arise if universities cannot reopen in a traditional residential form in the fall, as Kelly was just mentioning. Let me begin with the immediate costs that have already been realized. First, we need to recognize that universities were not in a healthy financial position before the virus. There's many reasons for this. Uh, some never really recovered from cuts in state support and research uh, spending that date back to the Great Recession. Others have allowed their costs to outpace many of their revenue uh, streams. That said, the virus has taken a mighty toll on uh, every university's uh, financial position. If we start with the academic side, the overnight movement from a residential to online education was a minor miracle uh, in that learning has actually continued. And Kelly was just talking about some of these things. Uh, faculty and, and students, in my mind, have done their best under difficult circumstances, but only a few years ago, uh, this shift would not have even been possible. Uh, the changeover has not been out without cost. Enormous IT resources have been needed and has been a heavy lift for faculty and students, most of whom had no prior experience uh, with a non-traditional classroom. Some students are, have asked for refunds because admittedly the education is not equivalent to what they uh, had signed up for with a normal campus experience. Uh, although I think that uh, it's uh, remarkably good given um, the uh, circumstances. And the university's cost uh, have not been less, uh, for example, faculty cost, uh, even though we've made this change. But there's a whole bunch of other costs that have been uh, experience during this change. For example, shutting down the campuses have resulted in refunds of, of the hospitality parts of the university. And in any ways you can think of the university as running a hospitality uh, industry, uh, which has been arguably the most hard hit sector of our economy. Uh, we have dorms, we have uh, cafeterias, we have parking, all of those have resulted in refunds. Uh, we also have lost revenue from hotels, conference centers, theaters, coliseums, stadiums. Meanwhile, stay-at-home orders and travel bans have grounded fundraisers and closed labs, stopping funded research on campus, which is a major source of revenue for large parts of universities. Cancellation of off-campus activities, such as research programs that require travel and study abroad programs during spring break and over the summer, and on-campus activities such as conferences and alumni and executive programs and development have resulted in huge financial loss. Hospitals, a major part of many universities, are losing substantial monies because non-essential work has either been postponed or canceled. Endowments are down because the capital markets have slipped and donors do not feel as wealthy as they did before nor as confident as they did about the future. Athletics, which is a key part of many campuses, have taken a major hit with the cancellation of spring sports and March Madness. Meanwhile, the, the calls of the university are largely fixed, faculty, infrastructure, et cetera. Now those are the known costs and those are large and uh, they have already been been built into our system. Those are the things that we know are going to affect us. Now for the unknown cost. 
the big question, and, and Kelly mentioned this one on every campus today is, how will we open in the, in the fall? Or will we open in the fall? Um, is it possible to have a residential campus without some form of treatment or vaccine? And you pack thousands of students in dorms, apartments, uh, Greek houses, et cetera, surround them with older faculty and staff and not expect a virus outbreak at some point that will ultimately shut the campus back down. What happens if there's a second wave that comes in the fall? If we must continue in a virtual form, will the students, will new students come and will all students return? It's one thing to finish the term with Zoom meetings and everyone doing their best during a crisis. It's another thing to start a new year in that form. Surveys of incoming students have shown that many are considering deferrals or gap years um, until somewhat normal residential campus life returns. If we remain in this virtual state into the fall, then all of those hospitality costs that I mentioned earlier will continue. Empty dorms, cafeterias, parking lots, hotels, conference centers, stadiums, et cetera. How many students will we lose because they or their parents can't afford college with unemployment soaring? Will the State Department, with, with the State Department not issuing visas currently, will any um, new international students be able to come to any uh, universities in the United States this fall. What's the impact on public universities of the shortfalls that states are going to be experiencing because of a reduced income taxes, sales taxes, et cetera? And if there's no football this fall, which tends to pay for all the other sports, will there be an athletic program? I think of those as the unknown challenges. So one might want to say, so what is the total cost that a university is facing because of the virus? I don't think anyone could possibly at this time be able to total up uh, the, the total cost because there's so many things that do remain unknown. But a few days ago, it was reported that the University of Arizona has already seen $66 million in loss and are projecting to lose as much as $250 million. That led that particular university to go ahead and, and uh, have widespread furloughs and pay cuts up to 20%, varying depending on, on the person's salary. I would not be surprised to see similar cuts and responses at other leading universities. Smaller, less well-funded and less well-regarded universities may never recover from the financial challenges of COVID-19. And in, in fact, I'm afraid that if some schools are unable to open in the fall in a traditional residential form, they may not be able to open at all. So the total cost of financial and business challenges that we're facing from this virus, uh, I think are certainly unprecedented in my career in uh, the academic side. Uh, I believe it's, it's easily uh, able to say that you'd have, probably have to go back to the Second World War to see a time that universities are facing the challenges that they're facing. Perhaps a, a vaccine comes uh, quickly and many of these unknown challenges uh, resolve themselves favorably. But where I sit right now, and I think where many uh, universities sit, uh, this is a, um, a dire circumstance. So on that encouraging note, I'll pass the baton to my friend and a longtime uh, leader who has thought deeply about the uh, education field, uh, Susan Cates, the CEO. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, that, that, that's a, definitely a, a depressing, a depressing, but I think accurate um, assessment and, and, and note to note to jump off from. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, as Doug said, I'm Susan Cates. I'm CEO of the Association of College and University Educators, or AQ, which is a company that works with colleges and universities to improve student success through effective teaching. I'm also a partner at Leeds Equity Partners, which is a private equity fund that invests exclusively in companies in the education sector from early childhood 
through workforce development. I've been in the education sector in various ways um, for over 20 years, um, including working for um, for quite a few of those with Doug at UNC. Um, certainly what higher education is experiencing right now as a result of the coronavirus is a massive disruption in the short term and, and a massive um, uh, event that will change higher education in the near term and I believe in the long term as well. And while there are many pieces of that that are are a loss and that are um, and that really do have negative implications, um, there's also opportunity in in what's happening um, right now in higher, for higher education um, and for learners um, in terms of the options that'll be available to them. Um, it's it's often been said we sh that one should never waste a crisis, um, and we are certainly in the midst of one. Um, but the opportunity for higher education to think about how this uh, this rapid transition, as Kelly said, this triage that higher ed institutions have done to providing remote learning for students in the near term can expose opportunities to experiment and increase flexibility in terms of how we deliver effective learning for students across the spectrum in higher ed um, is actually, is actually a, 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 a pretty exciting opportunity over the medium and longer term. Um, one, what, <clears throat> one thing to note is that as we think about the students that our higher education system serves in the US, it is not only the 18 to 24 year olds that we think of traditionally as the folks who are on campus in the dorms, participating in athletics in the, in the physical classroom. About 40% of the enrollment in post-secondary institutions in the US is over the age of 25, and many of those are, are working adults. Um, as, as universities move to thinking about what the fall looks like, what the next year looks like, what the next couple of years may look like in terms of disruption, and thinking more planfully and thoughtfully about how do we deliver online education, how do we deliver um, an exceptional learning experience um, virtually that will, by definition, expand the flexibility and expand the access for students to participate in, in post-secondary opportunities um, through different means that they, than they could have. Um, at these institutions in the past. Um, although what we many, what many institutions and many faculty are doing right now is, is triage. It is, um, there's no question in my mind that online learning done well and delivered thoughtfully can be as good or better as in-person education. Um, and the opportunity for universities and for faculty members to experiment and, um, and develop and deliver products and methods to reach students in ways that they, that they have begun doing over the last several years um, but can really accelerate doing in this crisis is an opportunity for expansion and an opportunity for new business models for higher education. Um, I, I, I talked to a, a former colleague who is the dean of a, a subset of a, of a major university on the East Coast this past week. And he said, what I see happening through this is taking a trend towards more online and blended education, towards 
certificates and shorter form products versus long form degree products um, and accelerating that trend and pulling us forward from where I thought we might be in 2025, pulling that forward to 2021. If that's if 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 we if we uh, if we accept the premise that this can be an opportunity, what are the what are the key areas that institutions really need to support that um, support that move and to take advantage of that opportunity? And some of these some of these um, reflect comments that Kelly was making with respect to what the institution has needed in the short term. The first piece of it is certainly um, what I think of as table stakes, technology infrastructure, and the and the basic training, basic um, accessibility um, uh, of tools and familiarity with uh, by faculty and staff with those tools to be able to support um, support online delivery. The second and really incredibly important piece of it is need improved teaching preparation and support for faculty. Um, the, in, in higher education, faculty, our faculty are incredibly deep in their subject matter areas and as part of PhD programs are trained on research methodology in a very effective way. Um, but many are not given comprehensive preparation for effective teaching um, based on what we know from the research really works. And while that's true across, across teaching broadly, it is, um, it is exacerbated by lack of familiarity um, as faculty move into online teaching and learning delivery. Um, so, so more comprehensive preparation and support around what works effectively, what techniques really engage students and deliver um, deliver better student outcomes in online delivery will be critical for, um, for higher education. The third piece of it is, is really improved access to, uh, to student services of all kinds. Um, because while we have moved rapidly in this transition to deliver um, uh, to deliver continuity in teaching courses, the, the infrastructure around all of the support that students need to, um, to effectively pursue their educational goals um, need to also be brought fully online and rethought for flexibility, remote access, um, uh, to be able to, to serve students um, longer term. On the, on the industry side, in terms of, of companies that are working in and around higher education, um, I think it, this, that this also presents an opportunity to, uh, an opportunity for growth in supporting those key areas um, in partnership with higher education institutions across the full spectrum and partnership, particularly in areas that are not, um, not deeply uh, rooted in um, inside the academic institutions to be able to support some of these uh, transitions and, um, and new developments. It is also an opportunity for, um, for, alternatives to higher education, which sort of underlines how important it is for colleges and universities to respond and, and, and to be proactive in thinking about how they evolve and grow out of this crisis. Um, because I, I, I do believe that this, that this crisis will also accelerate a trend towards alternative credentials towards shorter form um, learning experiences, in some cases stackable to larger credentials um, that are delivered in a more flexible way um, that employers will be the ultimate, um, the ultimate uh, decision makers on, on their success in terms of what they are willing to accept 
in in hiring um, and promoting folks. But I, I this is this certainly provides an opportunity for alternative credentials and alternative models to really accelerate, and that 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 can very much happen inside of our higher education institutions. Um, and if it doesn't happen as as much as as there's demand for, it will certainly happen in companies that are offering alternatives to traditional higher education. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Mackenzie to, uh, to open us up for, for Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Susan. And thank you to all of our panelists for those super thoughtful insights. Um, we've got a few questions in the queue now, but just as a reminder, um, all reporters, you are muted for the duration of the call. So if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so, including your name, organization, um, and if to direct the question one of our panelists, you're welcome to do so using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Again, for reporters joining us by phone, you are welcome to submit your questions to me via email, mckenzie underscore bab at keenan-flagler.unc.edu. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Seth Gulledge from the Triangle Business Journal. If universities do have to resume online instruction in the fall, I'm interested to know what they will have to consider lowering tuition fees because of the perceived drop in their value proposition. Or conversely, if they might have to consider raising tuition to make up for some of the shortfalls in their revenue stream. So Susan or Doug, I'm thinking maybe one of you would want to start with that. Yeah, I'll take a cut at that. Um, so uh, I don't really see that. Uh, well, let me speak at my university. Um, the in, in our situation, tuition is set by someone far away from the university, to be honest. So it's set by a board that sits some ways apart from the university. I, um, I don't actually think there's a close um, connection between um, how that board thinks of tuition, in our case, more or less the state, and where the uh, university's tightly tied. I do not see any situation in which tuition will be going up, particularly in this economic environment. Um, will it be coming down? I don't anticipate that. I think the more likely scenario is that students will, will vote with their feet and uh, more likely not to, to show. Uh, so that is the hesitancy and the concern all of us have about opening if we have what is perceived as an inferior product. Absolutely, thank you, Doug. Susan, anything you wanted to add to that one? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think I, I, I certainly agree with um, agree with Doug in terms of what the expectations are, um, particularly for for students who who want a traditional residential experience. Um, you know, I, I would just emphasize again that you know certainly for Working professionals, the trend that we've seen in graduate education, broadly speaking, across the country, is um, is a meaningful um, shift to more online and blended degree programs in graduate education. Um, and I, I, there are um, there are plenty of programs, um, including the including um, the program that Doug and I led together at UNC that are that are absolutely viewed as the the same quality and that I have confidence that deliver the same quality um, to students. The difference is that students on the front end are choosing to do that program in an online environment. Um, because it fits better with their life, it fits better with their career. They've made that decision up front. Um, I think it is a very different expectation for students who have chosen to do a degree program um, on campus, um, particularly for undergraduate residential students um, and thinking about that. So, you know, it, it, you'll see. I, I don't believe the I don't believe the underlying premise that online is actually less valuable if done thoughtfully and done well. Um, but I do believe that there's a a substantial difference in perceived value um, based on the 
based on the, the type of students. Great, thank you, Susan. Um, I'm Sue DiMaggio, I'm the uh, External Affairs Associate. McKinsey has gotten temporarily kicked off, so I'm going to try to, uh, to pick up for her here. Um, I do see, we have another question for you, Susan, and this concerns public private, public university partnerships. Um, how do you see those being affected uh, with this move to distance and online learning? And how are those relationships sort of different than the current ones that, uh, that we think of when we think of those relationships? Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, I absolutely believe that there will be um, more partnerships and acceleration in partnerships between universities and the private sector. Um, uh, that's, I've, I've had experience with that from both sides of the both sides of the aisle, if you will, um, uh, under more normal times, um, and believe that that there are companies that sit outside of traditional higher education who can bring expertise and um, and, uh, and and speed um, to develop and deliver. Um, uh, online services, support courses um, uh, in partnership with universities much more, much faster, more effectively than the university is able to do on their own. Um, and so I, I do expect that there will be um, an acceleration in this and opportunities to build partnerships on both sides of this. You know, one of the big one of the big challenges, though, is is thinking about many of those partnerships in the past have been targeted towards um, subsets of programs within institutions. What we're dealing with right now is sort of this mass mass migration um, uh, without uh, without the time to plan uh, in the that's happened here over the the very the very recent past. As you think about what that looks like over the coming year, um, looking for looking for more flexible partnerships that are um, that are able to support scale um, is going to be critical for institutions. Uh, and I think you'll also see acceleration in partnerships in areas where institutions have maybe traditionally done those on their own. So, for example, in executive education. Um, which many business schools do in partnership with um, with uh, corporate and government partners. Um, traditionally, most institutions, I think, have, have many institutions have have done those and delivered those on their own. Um, as the opportunity to bring people together in person um, is uh, is challenged, um, that's a that. That's an additional area for expansion of partnerships across higher ed um, that I think will be accelerated. Great, thank you so much for your uh, stepping in, Sue. I think one of the things COVID-19 is teaching me is patience with technology, which is uh, something I desperately need to learn. So thank you so much for stepping in. I've received several other questions. Um, so I wanna, I wanna start off from, an reporter we have with us, Hugh Thomas. The first is, uh, could you tell me a little bit about the impact COVID is having on students seeking merit-based scholarships and what students can do to attain aid for higher ed in the wake of the outbreak? Follow-up to that is, what will colleges and universities have to consider when it comes to making higher education affordable for the incoming class of 2024? Well, I, I'll try to take a stab at that. Um, you know, I think that... Um, at UNC, at least, uh, there's a fund that we've been raising money for, a student impact fund, uh, recognizing that both students are being affected by this, their families are being affected by this. And so we are trying to reach out to plug some of those holes that are occurring. Um, as far as that, that is really focused on sort of the immediate situation. I think some of those questions sort of asking about coming into the future. Um, I don't know that any of us have a really good handle on, on how far out in the long term this goes. So um, I haven't heard a whole lot of talk about scholarships. If you're thinking about four year degrees or that sort of thing, um, I expect and I have seen this with some of our own donors. 
Uh, they are they are particularly uh, interested in stepping forward generously to alleviate some of the pain that they're observing uh, so that this has as little effect as possible, particularly on disadvantaged populations, um, which we know are being hurt uh, even more than, than others during the virus. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, Hugh had a, had a second question as well that I'll share with the panel. Do you anticipate students uh, to look into enrollment into community colleges or enrolling closer to their homes? And what impact might this have on higher ed, especially for enrollment? Will universities try to mitigate enrollment decline through virtual programs? And uh, Susan, maybe this is one that you want to start with? Sure, happy to do so. Um, you know, and this is this is a, a more more from my perspective as thinking of it as a as a parent of a, a not yet college age child, but just thinking about it in terms of in terms of how I would be looking at it. You know, I I, I can certainly imagine that we will see um, uh, see students staying closer to home in the near term um, for. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Doug mentioned the impact of study abroad programs um, uh, as well, and um, I, I feel sure that we will see, um, uh, see fewer students who are venturing further afield, um, as well as thinking about how do, we, how do they minimize the cost burden that they're taking on in the short term. Um, and so for, certainly for the coming year, I would expect to see that um, to see that play out in a number of different ways. Um, with respect to to um, to universities thinking about um, uh, thinking about uh, about virtual programs and offerings, though, and notice there's another question as well about um, about institutions preparing for online delivery in the fall. And that that is that is a conversation that I I imagine is happening on every university campus around the country. Um, it's certainly happening at many of the university and university systems that um, that AQ works with. Um, and in talking to um, provosts and presidents of those institutions and systems, they are absolutely and um, and with urgency focused on how do we support our faculty to prepare for um, prepare for a fall that is likely to at minimum have disruption built into it um, and um, and 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 at worst be delivered fully online. Um, there are you know there are institutions that are doing a variety of creative things as well I, 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 with respect to thinking about changes to the calendar or changes to um, uh, to the way they're delivering courses to um, to build in more flexibility in their academic calendar um, to uh, to react to the the challenges that the that the next year plus are likely to bring Terrific, thank you. Our next question comes from Juan Perez at Politico. Uh, campus leaders may face conflict with state government when deciding how and when to resume normal operations. How might schools make decisions about reopening if concerned to spread, respread, um, while also facing potential pressure from governors to revive local economies? I, I can't speak for all campuses, I can tell you the way it's, it's being handled here at UNC. We're fortunate to have some remarkable researchers who are working on the front line on the COVID-19 uh, issues. And uh, they are not just advising campus leaders, they're also advising state leaders on how to think about these problems. And as far as I can tell, really they're, they're the ones that everyone's looking to, to try to give us some direction as, as to how to go forward. I could certainly imagine the, if you will, general economy opening up before the university campus could open up. Um, 
if you think about the density on a US, uh, on, on the traditional campus, it's a much, much more dense population that it that is in much more closer contact than um, than most adults in most communities. So we're going to have to be extremely cautious about what we do on a college campus, whereas normal uh, economic activity might be able to move ahead. Um, so I, I, I hope that we will not have a great deal of political pressure to move ahead with opening up a campus, particularly given that we have various means of teaching, uh, given the vulnerable populations that we have on a campus. What I do think is possible is that we may have classes in which um, we have the class half field um, because we go with smaller classes and we have more classes that um, uh, you attend and we make sure everyone sits well separated from each other. I could also imagine situations where we have uh, the class runs uh, in a, a traditional residential form but if uh, you want to attend in a Zoom setting, that's fine because every classroom is going to have a Zoom screen where you can come and go. Uh, we may very well have faculty who don't want to be uh, in that setting because they feel concerns about their own health. So I think we're going to have to be very slow and cautious on university campus because if we do have an outbreak, then parents are going to want their sons and daughters to come home, faculty, staff aren't going to want to move forward. We, we've got to be really careful about how we handle things on a college campus in ways different from Main Street in local communities or other business districts. Absolutely agree. And as someone who works on a college campus, thanks for that, Doug. <laughs> Appreciate <laughs> you keeping us safe. Our next question comes from Delise Smith-Barrow with the Hetchinger Report. Was the funding allocated to colleges and universities through the CARES Act enough? And why? Well, uh, Mackenzie, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm monopolizing things here, but I'll take a stab at that one too. So the CARES Act it was very helpful, um, but roughly half of that money is uh, flow through directly to students. So I think we have to be, we have to think about where that money goes. Um, the amount that, to just give you some sense of it, uh, I know at UNC, and I doubt we're any different from, from many schools, the amount of money that we got from the CARES Act uh, roughly equals the amount that we refunded in dorms and meal plans. And half of that amount which we got flows through to students. So it certainly is helpful, but the, the size of the losses that the college campus is, is suffering, uh, this is a help, but, but this is, it, it, we are far from being uh, anywhere close to made neutral, if you will, by the CARES Act. That makes sense. Um, Susan and Kelly, not sure if had anything to add. Um, so our next question was in, um, and it comes from a researcher who had a question for Mary. Um, Mary, do you think there will be new types of certificate programs for nurses as part of the switch to virtual learning? Um, and what do you think the long-term consequences for healthcare education, higher education might be? That's an excellent question. And actually, um, many uh, educators um, throughout the country are talking about uh, shorter term certificates and things like that to get people into the health uh, workforce much quicker. The long, what was the last part of the question? Long term effect? Yes. What will the long term effects be of the switch in, in recruitment for healthcare higher education? I think we're going to be okay this year. My concern down the future is how fast hospitals, how fast uh, health organizations are going to open up. One of the main areas that we really are having difficulty in is preventative care. Uh, people who need colonoscopies, people who need mammograms. Uh, the backup is gonna be amazing. 
And I think that higher education should really look at how can we mainstream that. Telehealth is good. It's been working very effectively, but there are times when, um, uh, you know, a patient has to be seen by a healthcare provider. The one thing I would like to see is that nurse practitioners um, be given uh, autonomy in their practice, which has not happened in North Carolina. It has happened with almost two thirds of the state. That could, I mean, two thirds of the country. That would really help in the long term to try to help get back to an acute care type of scenario to a preventative care type of scenario. And we need to get back there. Does that answer the question? I think that was great. Thank you. Um, I think this is going to be the last question that we have time for. Um, this is a follow-up from Delise Smith-Barrow from the Hedginger Report. Minority-serving institutions typically serve a higher percentage of low-income students. Do you anticipate guys struggling more than non-MSIs to rebuild their finances? And Susan, maybe this is one we might have you start with. Sure, happy to. Um, you know, I, I, think the, I think the impact of, the broad impact of this uh, of this crisis is going to be felt more heavily by institutions that ha that had um, that were facing fa financial challenges already, um, and uh, and and that you know that certainly um, uh, that certainly describes some of the minority serving institutions. Um, uh, as well as as small independent um, colleges that have been um, uh, that are not in in strong financial shape. Um, so I, I think there's there's that piece of it that uh, that for for institutions that are had financial challenges, this is this is um, even more of of the hurricane uh, that that Kelly referenced. Um, the a, sort of a separate piece of that is um, that the that we have to be as leaders across higher ed education, broadly speaking, very focused on how do we support um, and not exacerbate issues of equity in terms of access, but also in terms of outcomes and how can we ensure that we're supporting faculty and, and providing the additional supports necessary for, um, for students who are coming from a wide variety of backgrounds when they are facing the disruption that this is creating for their education as well. That's great. Thank you, Susan. And unfortunately, I know that's all we have time for. We did not get a chance to answer all questions. So reporters, please reach out to me if you would like to schedule follow-up interviews with any of the experts that you've heard from today. And as always, um, please see us as a resource. Um, we're happy to connect you with, with uh, any reference materials, any uh, you know, latest research, anything you may need in your coverage at this time. Um, thank you so much for joining. We'll be gathering again next Tuesday, same time, 11 o'clock Eastern time. Hope to have you join us again. Until then, take good care.